Okay, so this section for this next hour, we're going to talk about um, code management and testing that we have implemented and use for code management um, throughout our authoritative repositories that we use for the CCPP work. So just to bring us back to some of the things that were mentioned by Alicia and Grant earlier today about the different um, organizations of the, the different um, repositories we have for the physics organization. And we have three main authoritative CCPP public repositories. The first one here is the single column model. And this is under the NCAR organization, just like the other two. Uh, the next one would be the CCPP physics and the CCPP framework, which we've uh, discussed a little bit um, in the other talks. For all of these authoritative repos, we use main as the default branch. So if you go and grab the code, the main will be what you get by default. So if you were looking for releases or something, you would need to specify that in the checkout process. If you check out the single column model, that deploys the main branches of both the CCPP physics and the CCPP framework that are um, housed at the NCAR authoritative repositories. So I'm just going to jump right into a lot of GitHub specific uh, stuff. So if you're not familiar with GitHub, that's fine. Um, hopefully not all of this is, you know, completely abstract and it makes sense. But there's some there's a link here with more information that will walk you through the GitHub workflow, the idea of it and the process. But I'm going to just highlight those steps and how they relate to our code management we do here. So again, uh, we use the GitHub working, GitHub forking workflow. So how this works is there is an authoritative or uh, some type of repository out there that you want to contribute to. So the first step you need to do as a developer to contribute to this repository is to make a forked copy of it so that you have a place for a home place for your development work to live um, while you develop it. Because the idea is that the development happens external and then contributions will come into the authoritative repository when they are ready. So where you will fork your repository from matters on a little bit. I don't want to say it's the most important thing, but you could always open up um, pull requests, which I'll talk about in a few slides, from any uh, repository. It doesn't need to be even the same uh, type of repository. You could just open a PR into any other repository. But generally, these are the authoritative repositories that we suggest people to start working from. Uh, for the single column model, this is the NCAR authoritative repository. Uh, for the framework, this is also the NCAR authoritative repository. Where things get a little bit tricky is when we start talking about the physics changes. So where physics changes are targeted depends on the application, or where physics, which physics should be used depends on which application you're targeting. So for UF, UFS related applications, they have their own fork. Um, that changes go through before making it to the authoritative fork. Whereas the single column model uses the authoritative fork, or just the authoritative repository. I'm not going to call it a fork because it doesn't really have any context in that situation. So to, this is just to highlight these are the repositories you should start working with if you have development targeted for any of these applications. Um, so to create a fork, it's pretty simple within the GitHub web face interface. Once you go to one of these links here, um, on the upper right hand corner, there'll be a fork button. So here's just an example of the CCPP physics repository as of this morning or last night. Um, so on the, up, the upper part of this plot here, we have the CCPP physics GitHub repository. And there's a lot of different things here. I'm not going to get into all of them. But one thing you can see here is this fork button on the right here, just below this green arrow. And if you click on that and you have a GitHub account, it will take you to a page where a, a personal copy of the CCPP physics repository, in this case, will be added to your personal repositories. So for the NCAR physics, you can see we have, you know, 134 people have forked. Um, there have certainly not been 143, 134 people who have contributed back to the CCPP physics, but there have at least been this many people who have been developing it to some capacity. Um, 
Right. So, and then on the bottom here, after you click on this button and create your fork in your own personal, you know, repository, you'll see this, uh, the CCPP physics repository forked from the NCAR CCPP physics. Um, it also, you know, gives you some other information here about where it stands in terms of its status with regard to the code base back of the authoritative. In this case, this branch that I created is up to date with the physics branch in the authoritative repository. Um, I'm going to move along to the, the next piece here. So forks are the places that you have to create in order to contribute development to the, repo the authoritative repositories. Branches are spots on your fork repository that you actually do the work. So the branches are very lightweight and they can be created very simply. But what I'm going to go through here is uh, just a quick little walkthrough, a crash course on how to, you know, change some file in the physics in the single column model. So starting in this line in the middle of the left-hand side of the page where I say git clone. So this is the first you know, piece here where I'm cloning the GitHub repository for the NCAR authoritative CCPP single, single column model. I have this um, minus minus recursive here because that means I'm going to not only check out the single column model, but also any of its dependencies, which are known as submodules in the Git world. Um, so in the case of the single column model, the submodules are the physics and the framework that are checked out with this recursive option. So by default, this will get checked out into a local directory called CCPP slash SCM. So I'm going to actually go into the physics directory here. So I'm, you know, CDing into the single column model, into the CCPP, and then into the physics. And the first thing I want to do is tell GitHub that I know I just cloned from the authoritative repository, but if I make any changes and I want to you know, push these back anywhere, I want to push them to my personal fork repository. So the first step I do before I do any code changes is I add a new remote that points back to my repository. So in this case, I just call it Dustin Swales, and it has the same exact link as the authoritative repository. It's just pointing back to the forked repository from the previous slide. All right, so now I'm just going to get, you know, some file here and change it. Oh, sorry, sorry. Before I change files, I want to say that I'm, at, I'm creating a branch on my forked repository called bug fix for some file. So I do git checkout minus b and then some name so this checks out a new branch of code or creates a new branch and uh, puts me into that branch in this in this case it's bug fix for some file and then the next two steps i'm just you know I, I make i edit some file and i and you know make some changes to it and then to commit this change what you have to do is add the file and then commit it so these last steps here where i say git add and then git commit so I'm just pushing, or I'm sorry, I'm not pushing. I'm just committing this file to my local copy of code on my machine. And then this final step here, this git push, here's where I'm actually taking the changes that I created, which is a new branch, and I also edit a file. Um, and I'm pushing this back to my forked repository. So at this point, through these eight steps, these are basically the governing steps for workflow when it comes to GitHub. Um, create a fork, create a branch, push your changes to that branch on your fork. And then when you're ready, you will open up what is called a pull request to push those changes into the authoritative repository. So just in the bottom here, to summarize these eight lines of um, code I have here. Um, in this example, I made some changes to a file, create a new branch on my forked CCPP physics repository, and push these back up to GitHub. So just look, here's another snapshot from my personal GitHub repository. Um, I didn't actually create a new branch for this example, but here is, you know, what it would look like in your forked repository. If you just click on the branch tab, um, right up in the upper left here about where main is in this picture and all of your other branches that you have will be will will be highlighted so the next part 
after you have created a forked repository and you've opened up a new branch and pushed some changes to your forked repository, the next point, the next thing to do is open up a pull request. And GitHub pull requests are it's just terminology for pushing the changes formally back to the authoritative repository. So a pull request will go through a review process where um, subject matter experts will review these and uh, also the code managers. So to create a pull request, again, this is something that you'll do on the GitHub web interface after you've pushed your changes back to your fork repository. Um, so, right, so the first step here is to go to your, the GitHub website for your forked repository. In this case, it's the physics repository that I'm using as the example. There'll be a drop down menu on the left hand side to select a branch to view. That was just the last page I showed you. So, of all those branches that are listed, you could pick the one that you want to open up your pull request from, and you could also open up to, and also choose where you want to open it up to. Um, so after you've decided on which branches you want to open a pull request from and which and where you want to open it to, just click on the new pull request button. Um, this will create, you know, a template will come out where you put a short little title in there and a detailed description about what this pull request contains and any reporting on any testing you did for this pull request. Um, I should say this is kind of a generic outline on how to open up a pull request. Different repositories may have different requirements for what they want in uh, a pull request before it's opened or even looked at by the code manager. So this could vary. Um, so one other thing that I haven't touched on yet is the fact that these repositories all live within a, you know, a hierarchical organizational system of code management. And through GitHub, we you know, call these uh, submodules. Uh, or dependencies or external dependencies. So if your change happens to be in a component of a larger model, say the single column model, for example, you will also have to open up a pull request, not only into the physics for physics changes, but also into the single column model. Similarly, on a larger model side, like the, FV, or the UFS, you'll have to open up pull requests into any component affected by your changes. So when you open a pull request, or just before you hit the create button, so this is the picture of the web website that, or the GitHub website of just me trying to open a pull request for a developmental fork, or developmental branch I have on my personal fork. So the first thing that comes up on this top gray box here, um, you can see that the base repository is the NCAR CCPP physics and the branch is main. And I want to push in from a head repository, Dustin Swale CCPP physics. And I have this feature branch here that I'm trying to push in. The first thing that GitHub does is it, it tests to make sure that there's any, um, you know, conflicts or that these code bases are up to date, that they could be merged together. So the first thing you see is this green check mark that says able to merge. So that's always a nice first sanity check that GitHub provides that you are not completely out to lunch. Then below that, um, you'll see that it'll list all of the commits that you had into your personal forked, um, I'm sorry, your personal branch on your forked repository. Um, it'll list all of those here. And then below, which I don't have shown here, but it'll show all of the highlighted changes between the authoritative repository and your personal fork. And once you're happy with all this, you just click the create pull request button. Oops, sorry, the create pull request button here on the right, and it will open up the pull request. And anybody who is um, set up to get notifications for pull requests will get notified at this point that your code is ready for review. Another point worth mentioning here is that if your pull request is not ready for review, but you want to put it in the repository to get it on the eyes of the developer, maybe just as a heads up, you could always open a pull request as a draft form, um, which basically just allows you to use all of these GitHub um, web interface here to look at the code changes and, and open up discussion without formally doing it yet. So it's kind of like a pre-release or a pre-pull request. So up until now, I've talked about stuff that is on the responsibility of the developer or the user. 
So now I'm going to start talking about some of the, the testing, or I'm going to switch over to the testing for a moment and talk about some of the continuous integration testing that we have in the authoritative repositories. So what continuous integration is, is um, you know, these are exercised in GitHub through GitHub Actions, but these are workflows, scripts, um, it could really be anything that you want to test um, during the, the development process. Now, this could be something that's tested every time you make a push back to your personal fork or every time a pull request is opened into the authoritative fork. You could kind of control how often and how robust these tests are. But the idea of the test is that every time you interact with the GitHub interface, some workflow is kicked off that, can, that runs some tests to make sure that what you are introducing hasn't broken anything existing in the testing portfolio. So for the authoritative CCPP physics, we don't have a ton of tests, really. We just have kind of consistency checks to make sure that the physics are all you know, together. There's no missing submodules. We make sure that your physics is not breaking the host model for with, with which it's coupled to. As, as Grant mentioned in the previous talk, your physics changes often could require host side model changes. Um, and when you make these host side model changes and, or I'm sorry, if you make physics side changes and don't make host side model, model changes, that will break the host. So what these CI tests do is exercise the CCPP framework to test uh, the current CCPP physics that you're working on in your personal repository with the framework for the different hosts that are using the CCPP. So this test is very powerful. It alerts us to when you know, a developer is breaking changes. And from a code management point of view, it's very nice to have a test built into your system already so that when, it does, when something does break, all you have to do is point to the test and be like, you have to fix this. It's much harder you know, hashing thing, or you know, getting through issues through the discussion or issue or pull request process if it's, a, it's something that's not well documented or tested. But if it's implemented in continuous integration and it fails, it's on the developer to fix. So for the single column model, we have quite a bit of uh, testing or continuous integration tests. Actually, all of our testing is handled through the CI. So luckily, the single column model is pretty lightweight. You know, it's one column. It doesn't require a lot of data. So it's simple to build and run. So we have a, a whole suite of tests here that are you know, triggered every time a pull request is created. Um, I'll just go through them relatively quickly here. but. The, the big one is building and testing the single column model with different versions of Fortran and Python for different release modes for the single column model, um, debug and release. Debug is just a, is, is what it is. It's a, it's a debug version of the single column model so that it's more uh, robust with error checking and so forth. So we run those, so six for debug, six for release for three Fortran and three Python, so 12 tests total. Um, then we also do a more exhaustive test of the entire workflow. So this builds the entire um, uh, the, the, empire, the entire software stack, the single column model. It runs a regression test for both debug and release mode, and it compares them to baselines. Um, sorry. Um, then this one here tests CCPP pre-build step for supported host. This is the one that's also in each of uh, the physics implementations that test the CCPP framework part. Um, in this case, it's a pre-build uh, for a bunch of different hosts. So this alerts us to, it, say, for example, someone introduces a, changes in, a change in the physics repository and pushes it to the single column model. This test will run the, the coupling for, say, the UFS and say, wait, you push this change to the single column model, this is going to break the FV3. So it alerts us to those kind of things. Um, another test we have here is building and running the single column model workflow with the DEFI repository. So this was something that Alicia mentioned in her first talk. But the DEFI repository is um, a repository of single column model cases in this DEFI format, which the single column model also uses. So this test is just to ensure that if the DEFI format ever changes, we will be alerted to this because this test will break because this test goes and checks out the latest DEFI data and runs it with the single column model. 
Um, so another new test here, this was implemented recently. So this tests the UFS replay capability in the single column model. So this is uh, the ability to run, or sorry, create and run the single column model with UFS output. So this test, um, this continuous integration test uh, goes through the entire workflow where it uh, checks out the single column model, builds the stack, uh, builds the code. Um, it also downloads UFS, UFS regression test output and runs the creation scripts to create the cases from them in the single column model. So the idea of this test is if the UFS ever changes any of their output formats, this test will start breaking and we'll be alerted to and be like, hey, we've got to go in there. Oops, sorry. We have to go in there and you know reconfigure um, our interface to work with the latest um, IO. And then finally, we don't have any CI testing at the framework in the framework repository at the moment, but this is going to change in the coming weeks, months. We are working on getting some more testing into that framework repository as well. Um, so here again is just a snapshot from you know the GitHub website. Um, I opened up a pull request into my own repository just to kick off these tests. But this is just kind of an example of what you see on the GitHub web interface when you look at a pull request. Um, it you know it runs all 17 of these tests. Um, it puts a big, you know, green check mark if they pass, a big red X if they fail. Um, so it's it's very nice. It's very easy for us code managers to see, you know, without even looking at the code, without even looking at the description that the person or developer has left for the code, we have an idea right away of what we're dealing with. So another thing that I talked about when I was talking about the authoritative repositories was the fact that the UFS CCPP physics has their own forked repository that they use within the unified forecasting system. <clears throat> so this brings up another point that you know, I should highlight. Contributions from the physics can come from many sources. If the physics development is targeted for UFS applications, then it's, it is suggested that the pull request should be opened into the UFS physics community fork. For physics development outside of the UFS, the authoritative NCAR repository should be used. So this is kind of a roadmap based on where you started, your, where you forked your repositories from, where you started your development. This is kind of telling you where your development needs to go back in when you want to contribute it back to the authoritative repositories or the UFS fork in this case. Um, in the case of the UFS fork, the, the code managers for the CCPP physics are, are responsible for keeping both of these, the authoritative NCAR repository and the UFS repository, the UFS fork uh, up to date with one another. So what this means is as you know, a development comes into the NCAR fork, you know, at some point very soon after that, the code managers will open pull request into the UFS fork. Um, going the other way for developments that are targeted initially for UFS applications, they will go to the UFS fork and then the pull, then the code managers will open up pull request into the authoritative forks. So going either way, there's, there's this another level of pull request that, that happens after the developers contribute their work. And this is done by the code managers to sync up the repositories. So this is kind of a, a great schematic that highlights how this all works. So on the top, we have the UFS development branch. And these have contributions, which are gray circles or commits. Um, the line below that is uh, a feature branch. So this would be something that is um, in your forked repository that you're working on, or uh, it also could be a branch that's in that repository just for other purposes. But it's not the main branch is the point. And these blue arrows that are going from the line with the gray cir dark gray circles to the light gray circles is, is just kind of showing the, the contributions of changes in the UFS development stream, how they are implemented and incorporated into the UFS development branch. Then the, you can see these big, long sweeping arrows that come from the gray dots on the UFS dev branch line all the way down to the authoritative repo line in blue. These are the pull requests opened by the, the code managers to sync the repositories. 
The green dots on the main branch of the authoritative repository are contributions that come into the authoritative repository that aren't targeted for UFS applications initially. But if you go down here after the third green dot on this blue line, you can see there's this arrow sweeping back up to the development branch. So this is when this is the case when the code managers are now syncing the development branch with the authoritative branch. I'm sorry, the UFS dev branch with the authoritative NCAR branch. So this is just a rough schematic of how we keep these two things running together and synchronized. Um, and the responsibility of who does this depends on, you know, a lot of things. For this case, our only main case at the moment is it's for UFS applications. So in this case, the, the EMC and the DTC are responsible for the development on the UFS side, but when it comes to the authoritative side, that is just the responsibility of the DTC. So the next topic I'm going to top, talk about here are submodules within the CCPP physics. Now I've alluded to submodules within the single column model already because the CCPP physics and the CCPP framework are submodules to both the FE3, which is the atmosphere component of the UFS, and the single column model. But it's also possible for the physics to have external dependencies or libraries or schemes that are not part of the CCPP but are used within the CCPP. There could be reasons that physics are external to the CCPP. One obvious reason is that the physics are shared across other applications that are not CCPP um, focused. So maybe a developer has a scheme that's shared in CCPP models and non-CCPP models. For that kind of situation, we would import that scheme into ours and you know other developers would do the same within their host. Um, so this schematic here is just kind of highlighting the, the hierarchical flow of the submodules. On the left is you know, a simplified version of the UFS. I'm just showing the atmosphere component here, which lives, you know, in the UFS community model. And the atmosphere component, the FV3, points to the physics, um, which could also point to external physics. Um, and then on the right-hand side in the single column model, we don't have an atmospheric component. We just have the single column model because it relies on forcing data to drive the simulations. That will point to the authoritative CCPP physics repository, which also points to some external physics. So the point of this kind of schematic is to show that, you know, different, different implementations of the physics could point to different implementations of external schemes and so on and so forth. There's nothing here saying that the UFS and the NCAR need to use the same external physics, but they could be pointing to the same repository. So uh, submodules are very useful for a lot of reasons. It really, my main idea behind liking to use submodules, it makes this really clear distinction of where the responsibility lies. When things are organized in to different directories and hierarchically into different um, repositories, it's easier to assign responsibility to different parties. So externally developed schemes could live in one repository, whereas the coupling to the host could live above it. Um, this this allows for distributed development. So the what's nice about this is parameterization and CCPB development are completely decoupled. Sorry. So the development can march on um, under the hood, you know, without CCPP having to know about it or want to incorporate it yet. Um, but it's it's still happening in there. And then at some point, if any host application goes, hey, this one parameterization is really advanced, and we haven't updated our you know coupling to it, our driver. We should really think about getting these new pieces in. They could do that very easily when the core of the physics parameterization lives within a submodule. On the other hand, if you had a sub or if you didn't have a submodule and you wanted to introduce and update a parameterization, if you you know took a, an approach where you implemented this hard coded uh, scheme within your model, you will have to go to the other model and look at it and see where it changed and pull the changes over. Whereas if you have the core of the parameterization isolated to a submodule, it makes updating it very clear. It also makes it very clear what part is part of the scheme and what is part of the coupling to the host. 
which should be you know clearly defined because couplings of the host should live within the host model and in this case that would be the physics ccpp physics repository and in the case of the scheme parameterization that should live in the submodule below it so you know this allows people to pull in things into their development as needed or as desired they could stay as up to date with their submodule components as they like um, you know, this, this varies how often people update components of their model, depending on the application. There are some components that are updated nearly every time we have a pull request in the UFS weather system, and there are other components that are updated much less frequently. Um, and this is really straightforward to do from a technical standpoint. If you want to add a submodule to your repository, there's a quick, easy little link here that will tell you, you know, the three or four steps that you need to do to uh, do this. Okay, so on to testing. So with all of the, the code management responsibilities we have of reviewing pull requests and making sure all the code is compliant, there's also you know, this, this step of making sure that we're not changing results. And this is, this is a lot because there's a lot of tests within the UFS weather system with which the CCPP physics lives. So every time we have tests, we have to go through the, the, the testing gauntlet, of, if you will, of the UFS. So this, I'm going to just go over this uh, chart real quick, or this table, I'm sorry. Um, but first, on the bottom here, we'll have simple tests, which are unit tests that verify the software integrity using the CCPP single column model. So this is kind of like the stuff we talked about before, the continuous integration that we use in the single column model. Uh, then there's model regression tests. So these are host-specific applications and configurations of the component. So these are more robust. You could think of like in the sense of UFS applications. Oops, sorry. Uh, this would be like running the hurricane application suite or something like that. Um, or if you're from the NCAR side, I guess the CAM physics suite, which has many subcomponents. But the middle line of the middle two lines of this table, which are CCPP related, is basically what I want to focus on here because I don't want to get too much into what's done outside of the CCPP physics, which is really the the model line um, on the top because that's with all the heavy regression testing occurs. But for the physics, the suggested testing is that all model testing is done by the host before they push it i'm sorry all testing by the host is done by that host before opening up a pull request so and then the responsibility of where this lies we could see here on the the who and the test column so for things that go into the authoritative repository that responsibility falls on the the ccpp team and we run the regression test for all participating models using the authoritative repository of the physics just below that in the CCPP physics model uh, fork branch line. Um, so this is, on the, this is on the development side now. It's on them to run their test and their regression tests by them before we accept that up into the main repository. Um, and below the CCPP, we have the scheme. So this, is, this kind of follows the same um, processes the CCPP authoritative and personal forks where the developer though will run the simple test in this case but they will also still run the full regression test on the model that which their scheme is embedded in so one thing I want to mention here as a special case the DTC co-manages the CCPP physics fork of the UFS so we help run some of those tests So this is just to summarize what I, you know, kind of just blurt it through and real quick on that last slide. But in general, the physics contributions need to be tested by the respective host models before we open a pull request. The CCPP single column model doesn't really require too much on the, the developer side because a lot of this is handled through CI. Um, but, you know, the UFS weather model requires high performance computing for testing. It runs a whole gauntlet of tests that test operational configurations, coupled configurations. So there, and it does this on a half dozen or so compilers across many platforms. So it's a very exhaustive test. 
And then just to, you know, on the bottom here to highlight again, you know, we do run these tests for the UFS fork, I'm sorry, for the NCAR authoritative repository when there are changes coming in from the UFS fork. Okay, so now I'm going to talk about a couple things real quickly, just a little a couple subtopics that we'll get into more detail tomorrow during breakout session A. But one of these topics, in addition to some of the other topics we've already discussed in this session, um, one of them is code releases. Um, and as it stands right now, the CCPP re, you know, provides up-to-date documentation for releases of the single column model and the physics. And this happens you know, but on a one-year pace. Last one was summer of 2020, 2022. So it's been a little over a year, but we have one in the works, I believe. Um, but worth mentioning, though, is, is even though the documentation is only updated once a year and there are only official releases once a year, the physics and the single column model are updated quite often throughout the year. I mean, sometimes several times a month, um, but not always the documentation. Sometimes documentation does get updated with um, physics developments if the developer is kind enough to include those uh, changes with their innovations. Um, so besides for the CCPP official releases, uh, we also, you know, there are also UFS application releases. Um, and we don't directly support these always, but when this does happen, we will um, tag the code base uh, uh, for posterity. So we will apply tags that were applied in the, on the UFS um, community modeling side to the NCAR repository. So this would happen when the code managers open up the pull requests from the UFS fork to the NCAR authoritative. If the pull request that was coming from the UFS fork was associated with a UFS application release and tag, we'll apply that tag to the uh, authoritative repository and also into the single column model so that people could use the single column model with the same physics as the UFS. So that leads us to the next subtopic, which would be tagging. So tags, I didn't describe in the previous slide, but I referenced them like four times. But tags are used to reference a, a, a point in the code base history. If you ever are on GitHub and you see these big, long 30 digit alphanumeric characters, those are the hashes that you know are unique to each uh, commit but tags are just aliases for those hashes to make it easier and more user friendly so we as code managers like to use these like i said before for releases and for um, of the ccpp and also anything that comes in from the ufs side uh, so i mentioned this in the previous slide but when a ufs app has a release and applies a tag to it we will propagate this over to the appropriate NCO repositories so that the code base is preserved so that you can do the same experiments. Um, here are links to some of the tags that have been, um, you know, applied to the single column model, the physics, and the UFS fork of the physics. Um, just for warning, there's not a lot of tags in there. This is, um, you know, something that we haven't done historically a lot of tagging of the code base, but um, we're open to it, and there's no, you know, major objections to doing it if users want to preserve their uh, history of contributions more closely. So an another topic is, you know, related to tagging is individual scheme versioning. So in the CCPP physics world, we do not tag individual parameterizations or version them. We just tag the individual uh, configurations or suites is the terminology in the CCPP physics world. But there's nothing preventing individual developers to applying, you know, semantic versioning or some other type of versioning, um, you know, paradigm to what they are doing. Uh, and that could, you know, live within the, the CCP physics and they could apply tags accordingly if they want. Um, it's just that we don't do that because, you know, as Ligia showed, Yesterday, or no, yesterday, sorry, earlier this morning, uh, all of the different types of processes we have parameterizations for, and some of them we have a half dozen or so. So there's, you know, 30 or so, maybe even, maybe more, I don't know, number of different parameterizations in the physics that would all need to be versioned separately. 
So that's something that the CCPP hasn't taken on historically or, or you know, worried about. Um, but, you know, we could talk about this more tomorrow in breakout session A if this is interested, if people are interested in um, adding more of this to the code base. Okay. And that was my last slide. So I ended a couple, about 10 minutes early, if that's okay. Um, we have time for questions. There's There's been a bunch of questions in the chat. Um, Alicia and I have have tried to answer some of them, but it, it might be worth going through and see if you agree with our answers. Right, no, <laughs> but, I mean, I, let me just start from the top here. This is from Jimmy Dudia. Um, Does the pre-build test need your scheme to be in a suite to detect new variables that might mismatch with the host, or does it not depend on suites? It doesn't depend on suites. It just compares the, the metadata and variables defined on the host side with the meta metadata and variables defined within the physics scheme. So it doesn't do anything related to the suites. But don't don't you have to give CCPP prebuild a suite to do anything. Oh, yeah. Sorry, yes. So right, that, so that, that... The... sorry, yeah, yes. <laughs> we run the CCPP build with a, a set of supported suites that co coincide with the CCPP releases. So right now they're using the suites that were in the V6. I'm sorry, Grant, yes, you're completely right. Okay, I'm sorry, I'm just reading this here. Yeah, I, I was just saying like, if you really wanted to, um, if, you, if you have a new scheme and you just wanna um, make sure that the plumbing is okay between the host and that new scheme, you could just create a very simple suite definition file consisting of that one scheme and then run CCPP prebuild with that simple suite. And that will at least, you know, do the checking to make sure that that the host has all of the variables that the scheme is asking for. This is true. Yes. Um, so Jimmy's next question, can a new scheme be added to the authority to repo as long as it doesn't break any of the suites in the pre-build CI? Um, yes, I mean, we, I, I think so. I mean, this depends again on where the code that you're trying to contribute is going. If it's, if it has support and it has people working on it, we will let code in before it's ready so that people could be working on it, at, you know, before it's actually deployed in any actual application. Uh, okay, so this is from Grant. Would owners of schemes in CCPP physics submodules ever want to advertise that there is a new version available? For example, it's, it's always on the CCPP physics managers to pull in the submodule scheme updates on their own schedule, i.e., would Robert Pincus let us know when we should, we should update the RRTMG submodule hash? Yes. He has been bugging me forever to constantly update this hash, and I don't, but I will. So, right, we don't have a formal way of doing that. This kind of comes down from developers communicating with one another. Um, you know, I worked with Robert for a long time, so this case may not be applicable for a generalization, but, you know, whenever, and whenever there was anything new on the RRTMGP side, Robert would send an email to me and probably someone at EMC being like, hey, get this in there and try it out. So that's kind of how we've worked so far. Okay, yeah, I mean, I think you, you mentioned that it's typically on it would be on the CCPP code managers to seek out, you know, updates from um, sub schemes that are uh, managed as sub modules. But I'm just like, I'm trying to think about if this scales up and there are lots of schemes that are as sub modules, like, it just seems like a lot of, you know, are you ready yet? Is there, is there an update ready yet? <laughs> or, or, or should we just wait until like, they advertise and say, hey, you know, this we think there's a good update here. We'll probably have better performance. You should think about pulling it in. Like I, I just like which direction that goes is is not a hundred percent clear to me. You're right. It's not it's not clear to me either how that works. I mean, you know, um, in previous in a previous life working in, in with CAM, I mean they had some module components that were updated every three years, right? So it, it depends on how often the host model wants to pull in these changes. It's entirely up to them. 
once a host model has a working version of something, they may be happy and just say, no, we're good. We don't see any problems. We're not going to mess with it. We're, you know, we'll just leave it as it is. Um, but then maybe three years down the road, they want to update. And they could. If it's a submodule, it's a little bit easier than if it's distributed code that's been given these different flavors across different modeling institutions. Right. So, OK, Grant, you responded to Jimmy. Sorry, I'm talking out loud as I read these. Um, so there's not really any more questions. There's more discussion about governance and how to, you know, really connect and work and integrate all of these different pieces of, you know, that go into a distributed development model. Yeah. So, so Ted asked if, if uh, every model, would every model make its own fork? Would every host make its own fork? If you are going to contribute to development back to the authoritative repository, then you're going to need a fork to initiate these changes. Yeah. But if you're just a user and not a developer, you don't need a fork. Fork is just for development. But Dustin, uh, perhaps the question is a higher level. So not, not contributing uh, development as an individual developer, but a host model. So would every mo every model make its own fork. So our code management plan uh, says exactly that, that there would be a CCPP authoritative, CCPP physics authoritative, as well as forks for the participating models, just like there is today for the UFS. So that uh, other communities could contribute through their forks, everybody contributing to their fork, and those will get synchronized with the authoritative repo at regular intervals. Should I uh, just go ahead? I had my rent hazed. I don't know. Rent, whose turn is it? I can't uh, see any hands. Lisa, you had your hand raised. <laughs> OK. <laughs> Took forever to find the button here. I just, uh, I just wanted to say that uh, this code management is uh, you know, partially well implemented in particular for the UFS and the single column model. I mean, because those models have been around for a while and using CCPP for a while. Uh, for the uh, NCAR models that uh, are more, I'd say, you know, new and experimenting with, new in experimenting with CCPP, they do not have their own forks of this authoritative repository today. What they have is separate repositories. So both uh, M cubed, NCAR M cubed for WARF and PES and CM1 have a separate repository. And the CGD climate folks have uh, their own repository where they're making their physics CCPP compliant. How this is all going to evolve going forward, how the, all these repositories and these different physics go forward in a uh, you know, well-organized fashion is to a topic of a lot of uh, conversation in our CCP, CCPP physics code management meetings. So not everybody is working off the same repo at this time. I think Feng Lin had a question. Um... I can't see if anybody has their hands raised. No, uh, doesn't, I don't have a question. I just, I'm just thinking a sub module repository like the RTM GP. After a while, it's, it becomes so different from what we have been trying to work to in, get into the UFS uh, from yeah. this com communication with Dr. Pinkers. Um, I, I think there's an advantage or disadvantage. Uh, I'm a little bit concerned if we have too many uh, sub-modules. It's going to become very difficult to manage. Yeah, I mean, I, I understand that. But I, I think you don't really need to manage it if it's, if, I mean, what difference is a sub-module, a piece of code in a sub-module versus a piece of code that lives in a module in your own repository? The only difference is the piece that's in the sub-module, you know, when you update it, you you could pull the changes in without having to you know go through the other host model. You don't have to pull any of these changes in if you don't want, and the submodule could just be stagnant. And essentially, if you wanted to, pull it directly into your code. But I think the idea of keeping pieces as submodules is to make the code more updatable. Uh, it's a question of the ownership. 
my case, Robert has been working closely with us and you, uh, uh, but it's not an issue. <laughs> I'm just afraid that if I have a, a scheme controlled by some individual, uh, other right. developers will become very difficult to make contributions. Right. I mean, that that's a decision for the, you know, the government, you know, the people who are making decisions on what schemes they want into the repository that they, you know, I don't think there's anything saying that, you know, we need to accept a, a sub module from cowboy bill that does a PBL scheme, like we don't need to do that. But if there's a contributing community partner, like say another lab or a, a private industry partner, like AER has always been like, I think those are less risky than say individual developers like cowboy bill yeah i agree with you so it's i mean i don't have like a i don't know what's the best way forward from a systems engineering point and a software engineering point having components that are updatable makes more sense than rigid code um even if you're not updating it often but i do see the problem like you know like you mentioned with rtmgp since the last time it's been updated, you know, it'll take someone a day or two to really get in there and make it work with the latest and greatest. Yeah, um, I mean, Jimmy just said that it, no MP is going toward using a submodule and, and uh, version tags. Um, I mean, this is one of the topics for discussion tomorrow. So I, I think we can continue talking about it and, um, you know, try to figure out the best practice going forward. Um, you know, with, with sub modules and tagging.